Добрий вечір або добрий день для тих, хто в західній півкулі. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for the possibility to speak here. So my talk is about two groups. And I'm going to be interested in very basic questions from the group theory. Generators, relators, isomorphism between groups. So one of the groups is the famous Grigor Chu group, which has already been mentioned in the in the morning talk by Rostislav Grigorchuk and in yesterday in the talk by Dmitry Savchuk. The other group is a certain topological full group. So first let us begin with the Grigorchuk group. The Grigorchuk group was constructed in 1980 as a simple example of a finitely generated infinite torsion group. Torsion means that every element is of finite order. So this, in this group, every element has finite order, uh, while the group itself is infinite and at the same time finitely generated. So that was, at the time, the simplest example of such a group, and it probably still is. So indeed, it takes less than five minutes to describe this group and less than 15 minutes to prove with all details that this is indeed an infinite torsion group. Uh, Subsequent study showed that this group has many other properties and being an infinite torsion group is not even the most important of them. Most important is that this is the group of the intermediate growth. Uh, so the number of elements of length n in this group grows with n slower than the exponential function of n but faster than polynomial. Okay, by definition, by construction, the group was at transformation group, but let us begin with representation due to Lysionok from 1985 as an abstract group by generators and relations. So there are four generators A, B, C, and D, and this set of relators, it's infinite. This group is not finitely presented. One reason is the intermediate growth. So infinitely many, but it's a recursive representation using this substitution sigma, substitution over the alphabet A, B, C, D. A goes to A is substituted by ACA, explodes into a word of length three, and B, C, D are just cyclically permuted. So well, let's take a look at this presentation. We have some simple relators, A squared, B squared, C squared, D squared, which means all generators are involutions. Then we have B, C, D equals one. Together with in being involutions, it implies that B, C, and D commute with one another. And together with one, these three generators form a Klein four group. And then we have those complicated generators, AD to the fourth and AD, AC, AC to the fourth. So we, we start applying sigma and we apply it infinitely often to each of them and then generates an infinite set of generators. And this presentation is optimal. There is no, there is no redundancy here. Every generate, every relation is uh, essential. Okay. Okay, now let's uh, concentrate on this substitution. A goes to ACA, B to D, C to B, D to C. And once we have a substitution, there is a certain machinery developed in topological dynamics. Substitutional dynamical system. So the general setup, we have an alphabet, finite set, and the substitution, which is a map from that set to the set of finite words of that alphabet. And then it extends to action on finite words. Where we, apply, where we apply the substitution separately for each letter, and also we can act on infinite words as well. The first task is to produce a fixed point for the substitution. We begin with A. Sigma of A is ACA. Now let, it, let us apply sigma again. Sigma squared of A, ACA, B, ACA, or akabaka. And then again, akabaka, dakabaka. And then again, and then you can continue. So what we see, every word here uh, extends the previous one. Sigma of A is the beginning of sigma squared of A, which it's, it in turn is the beginning of sigma cube of A, A, and so on. And the reason for that is simply that A is the first letter for the word sigma of A, and then it follows, easily follows by induction. And so because of that, because all these words agree, in the limit, these finite words produce an infinite word. And it's easy to see that that infinite word, I denote it C, 
this infinite word is a fixed point of the substitution and it's easy to see that that's the only fixed point. Okay. Another feature of the word ACA is that it's a palindromic word, the word of odd length and it's symmetric with respect to the middle letter. And from this, it follows by induction quite easily that every of these finite words, sigma squared of a, sigma cubed of a, sigma to the fourth of a, each one of them is also a palindromic word. Okay, so that, this dynamics is simple, but now we take this uh, sequence and we produce something more complicated, which is called the substitution subshift. So that's two-sided subshift generated by this, uh, this infinite sequence. So the construction applies to any infinite sequence, not just this particular one, but, uh, and this is going to be called subshift. But since this particular sequence comes from the substitutional dynamics, uh, the name for that is substitution subshift. So two-sided subshift, uh, the phase space is by infinite sequences. So it sequences which go both to infinity, to the right and to the left. So they're indexed, elements are indexed by uh, uh, integers. To locate, uh, since it's not one-sided sequence, we don't have any beginning. To locate uh, the numbers, we use this decimal dot between position number zero and position number one. So that way you can tell what, what's going on here. And uh, so if you consider all such sequences, by infinite sequences or some alphabet, alphabet here is A, B, C, D, we get the full shift, we get uh, space for full shift, but uh, chosen the sequence C, we on, now we only consider those by infinite sequences, uh, which are piecewise like C. So any piece, any chunk of that by infinite sequence, any finite chunk has to appear somewhere in C. And so that we don't have all by infinite sequences uh, that way, just some of them, some or two of them. And then the transformation is just we take this uh, by infinite sequence and we shift it to the left by one position. Or alternatively, you can think of them of that as just uh, keeping the sequence intact, but just the moving that decimal point, one step, one one position to the right. Okay, so that's the transformation. Uh, Omega has natural, if it will assume it's infinite under some non degeneration condition about uh, C, which obviously met here. It's a counter set, there is natural topology, and this is a homomorphism that counter set. Okay, now this sequence, that because it comes from the substitution, has some additional properties. It's so called tuplet sequence. Tuplet sequence is sequence which is almost uh, periodic. It's not periodic, but it's almost periodic. So for any position, uh, you can find a, an arithmetic progression such that the index of that position is that in that progression and all uh, elements uh, with, with numbers for that progression are the same. So it means in particular, any finite part of the sequence is reproduced regularly in this sequence again okay the minute the minimal uh, difference common difference of such uh, progression is called partial period and so it turns out that the sequence our sequence c is a tuplet sequence of partial periods two four and eight let, let me quickly return back to the previous slide when i have the sequence so you see every every other letter is A. At, at odd positions, all, all everything is A. At even position, everything is different from A. Now, if the number of position is even, but not divisible by four, that, that letter is C. If the number of the position is divisible by four, but not divisible by eight, that's going to be B. Divisible by eight, not divisible by 16, that's going to be D, and then they start repeating. Divisible by 16, not divisible by 32, again C, then again B, again K. Okay, so it's a tuplet sequence of partial periods, two, four, eight, all powers of two are present, 
with, with no exceptions, and then imply some further uh, remarkable things about this top toplet sequence. Even among toplet sequences, these are the most close to, as close to periodic as you can get. Uh, one corollary is the subshift is minimal. Subshift is minimal, uh, this, this is true for any toplet sequence. Minimal means it's indecomposable, Beyond every orbit is dense, or in other words, there is no invariant closed subsets other than the empty set and the entire omega. Now, because of the fact that sigma is obtained, C is obtained as a limit of palindromic words, this space omega is invariant under the flip map. We have by infinite sequence, we can flip plus infinity with minus infinity, just flip with respect to that decimal point. And uh, after the flip, the, the new sequence, by infinite sequence, it will also be in omega. It's this invariant. Uh, and when you conjugate the shift by f, well, clearly you get the inverse shift. Shift late uh, when you shift to the left. And then in, when you flip everything, this left shift becomes right shift. The inverse shift. Okay, and now uh, when we have a minimal homomorphism of a contour set here, we can apply this construction of topological full group. So, uh, <clears throat> so we, we have any minimal homomorphism of the contour set. Topological full group consists of all homomorphisms of the form s of x equals t to the power of nu of x of x. So at each point, s acts as a power of t. And that moreover, that power depends continuously on x. So nu is a continuous function. Now what is the range of that function? The range of that function is integers. We have a continuous function which takes integer values. How is this possible? This is only possible if this function is locally constant. It's locally constant. And because of compactness of the counter set, it takes only finitely many values. So what we have, there are only finitely many values and level sets are, so open sets, which means they're both closed and open. So we have a partition of the counter set into finitely many pieces, which are closed and open. And on each piece, this transformation acts as some power of t. So you can think of this logical full group as consist consisting of homomorphisms, which can be represented as piecewisely, piecewise the power of t. Okay, now it will, it will, you know, nice feature of this group, it's countable. Because you, there are only countably many clump and some sets. So you see in this construction, if you want to construct an element, you do the partition into clope and sets, then on each of the piece of the partition, you choose some power of t. And then you have your transformation. And not, not, not every choice produces a homomorphism because you, you, you can get a continuous map, but it's not necessarily inverted. But even in this construction, there are only countably many choices. So it's a countable group. Okay, and it one, if the group was, uh, introduced by Giordano Put Putnam and Skow in the paper from 1999, they proved that this is an almost complete invariant of the topological dynamics. Namely, topological full groups corresponding to two minimal transformomorphism, isomorphic if and only if, T is topologically conjugate to S or inverse. So almost complete characterization, well, except except that you cannot determine which way time goes in your dynamical systems, forward or backward, but other than that, you get the complete information. So somehow this group, as an abstract group, encodes the dynamics completely. But somehow it's hard actually to tell. So it means for any topological property of the transformation, there is some group theoretic property of the topological full group that is responsible for that. And conversely, any group theoretical property of the topological full group may have some dynamical meaning. But very rarely this can be done explicitly and very rarely it, it can be explained in simple terms. Okay, so uh, now, now let's proceed uh, 
how to describe this group? Well, the key theorem is theorem by Matui from 2006. The topological full group is generated by T and all elements of finite order. So you have T and you consider all elements of finite order and that's enough to generate the entire group. So to describe this group, it's enough to look at the elements of finite order. How to produce elements of finite order? Let me explain one simple construction. Suppose you have a clopen set, close and open, U. And suppose that when we apply T to that set, several times, the images are all disjoint. Then we can, suppose we have N images, so together N plus one disjoint clopen sets. Then we can define a map as follows. On U, U is mapped to T of U as T. T of u is mapped to t squared of u, t squared of u mapped to t cubed of u, and so on. The last one, t to the n of u, is mapped back to u, but this time we use a power of t which is negative n power. So basically, we have a primitive. If you think of u as a neighborhood of some point, and t of u is the neighborhood of its image, and so on, so we have some permutation. We have chunk of the orbit x t of x, t squared of x, and we have a permutation of that chunk of the orbit, and this and this can, and now we permute these points together with their neighborhoods. It's kind of generalization of a permutation. This permutation is very simple, it's a cycle, but similarly you can you can take pretty much any permutation on n plus one elements from zero to n and you can realize an element of that group. You see, that's an element of the, the topological uh, full group of a piecewise a power of t. And it's of finite order, it comes from permutation. Now, it's of a spe special interest are elements of order two. When you have just u and t of u, uh, so th this one generalizes transposition, and even to be precise, neighboring transposition of two neighboring numbers. I denoted delta u, delta as in duo, uh, Greek for two. Okay, now one feature here, you see, because of that, this is a general construction. It shows that you can embed symmetric group on any elements, any number of elements into the topological full group, any topological full group. So as a consequence, uh, the topological full group contains a copy of every finite group. So the, the structure is not that simple. And you recall, they were introduced as a classification tool to classify dynamics. And so when we have some fear, property which is featured by all of them, it's not really helpful for classification. And so you may think maybe we can consider something simpler uh, for group, what can be simple? Let's take a quotient by some subgroup and maybe a quotient away all this common part and leave only essentials. Well, unfortunately, this is not going to work because, as shown by Matui, the commutator group is simple. And so when you want to quotient, you will quotient away all commutators. What was left, what will be left is just some abelian group, and you will lose, lose all the information about dynamics. So we, we have to deal with those complications coming from many, many finite, finite subgroups inside. Okay, so that was general theory. Now let's get back to our substitution subshift, that special tuplet sequence coming from that special substitution. Now for substitutions, have to uh, what, what are the clopen sets? Nice examples of clopen sets are when you choose a pattern, fix some pattern, say word finite word u to the left of the decimal point, finite word w to the right of the decimal point. And you consider the set of all sequences which um, match that pattern. For the full shift, you can choose any pattern. Uh, for the subshift, uh, well, you can also choose some, any pattern, but for some patterns, uh, this cylinder may be empty. And one can show that any clopen set is the disjoint union of cylinders. Uh, the dimension of the cylinder, uh, by, by definition, is the length of that pattern. If the length is long enough, then you can decompose any uh, <clears throat> clopen set. So in uh, now, uh, 
any cylinder, if the pattern is not empty, is disjoint from its image. Because when we shift by one, we cannot match the same pattern. Because if you recall C, every other letter is A and every other letter is different from A. So there is no two, you cannot have the same two letters together. So it's the, any cylinder is disjoint from its image. And so this generalized transposition, delta, is always well defined. And it turns out that this group is finitely generated and is generated by nice generating sets when we have T and then just three elements of finite order. Uh, generalized transpositions coming from three cylinders. Two cylinders are very simple, one letter pattern, PD, and then six letter pattern. Okay, uh, so as an example, uh, there are four possible one letter patterns, A, B, C, and D. I only used here B and D, so A and C can be, transpositions for A and C can be uh, expressed in terms of these. Well, the, these are the formulas, so you see how, how the general representation looks. So we have a product of some, uh, those generalized transposition delta, and they're conjugates by T. See, since it's an element of finite order, the total power of T has to be zero. So it's just the product of some deltas and some conjugates by powers of T. Okay, a few words how, how this is, um, how to prove this, when to generate it. So we have this, uh, you know, the topological full group is generated by T and all transformations of finite order. It's quite easy to show that any transformation of finite order can be decomposed as the product of these generalized transpositions. That's basically a generalization of the usual theorem from basic combinatorics that any permutation is a product of transpositions. Okay, so the strategy is we choose T, we choose a bunch of those generalized transpositions delta and we try to generate everything. So we choose for some sets U and we need to generate for everyone. Uh, some tools, suppose uh, U is the disjoint union of two flow concepts, U1 and U2, and uh, delta U is well defined, so there are no overlaps. Then the delta U, the transposition for U, is the product of transpositions for U1 and U2. So this means if you can generate that general, the delta for U1 and for U2, you can do this for the union if it's disjoint. But similarly, you can do this for the proper set difference. If one set is a subset in the other, and you can generate delta, generalize this transposition, generalize transposition for each of these, and you can do this for the difference. You see the formula is the same. So in fact, you can do this for symmetric difference. This joint union and proper set difference is all both are particular cases of uh, the uh, symmetric difference. Another tool, you can apply the transformation. If you have delta U, when you conjugate it by a power of T, you get delta for the image of U under that T. And so <clears throat> you see that now this problem can be reformulated in terms of Clopin subsets in omega. So Clopin subsets form a Boolean algebra. And the goal is we start with a few sets, and we have these operations at our disposal. We can take this joint union, set proper set difference, apply the transformation. Can we generate the entire Boolean algebra? That way? If we can, then everything is fine. Unfortunately, we cannot because one important operation is missing here. We cannot take the intersection, and without intersection, it's not go. You don't get generate uh, uh, many things. So this is not enough. And now theorem by Matui is that for the commutator group, this can be done if uh, our transformation is topologically conjugate to minimal subshift. In our case, it, it is minimal subshift. Then at least we can do this for the commutator group. Why so? Well, because Matui found another lemma, so it, it, which involves intersection. So wait. When you have delta for the intersection of two clopen sets, you cannot really find the formula for this delta 
he found the formula for the commutator of that generalized transposition with the shift. And that is expression involving just delta u1, delta u2, and t. And so that way, that way, that this is enough to gener generate the commutator group, but it's not enough to generate the entire group. So, uh, so some, so, some uh, further work was, was required. Okay, so this is about the proof, and now uh, I have a few more minutes to discuss the relation between this topological full group and uh, the Grigorchuk group. So let's get back to the Grigorchuk group, and now let's define it properly as a transformation group. Uh, so we, we don't have much time, so I'm going to do this uh, uh, quick and dirty. Consider the set of infinite strings over the alphabet 0, 1. So this time, no subshifts. We consider all strings of zeros and ones, one-sided. And then the Grigorchuk group acts on this set. It's a group of transformations of this set. It, it is generated by four transformations, A, B, C, D. And they act as follows. The generator A acts in a very simple way. It only changes the first digit in every string. Zero goes to one, one goes to zero, and the rest is kept as it is. B, C, D, the other three act in more complicated way, but similar. So we look for the first zero in a given string, first zero, and then the digit right after that first zero, denoted by star. Then out of these three generators, two of them will change that star, and that will be the only action. And the third one will not change, will not change anything at all. Which one will, will rest? and which two will work, it depends on n, or to be precise, on the remainder when you divide n by 3. So th this is the rule. If the remainder is 0, if n is divisible by 3, then b will do nothing. If the remainder is 1, d will do nothing. If the remainder is 2, c will do nothing. It's how to describe this. This is the Grigorchuk group. Let me also describe the Grigorchuk overgroup. It's a logic group. So the Grigorchuk overgroup is also generated by four transformations, A, B hat, C hat, D hat. A is the same as before. It changes only the first digit in every string. B hat, C hat, and D hat are defined similarly to B, C, D. Again, we, we scan our input string for the first zero. And when we find that first zero, we may change some the next letter right after that first zero. But this time, out of these three generators, only one will do the job, only one will change that star, and two will do nothing. And again, which one will do the, the work and which two will uh, be freeloaders? Uh, it depends on the remainder under division of n by three. Namely, d will change it if n is divisible by three, c will change it if the remainder is one, and b will change it if the remainder is two. And it, it's a simple relation between generators. Each generator of the Grigorchuk group is the product of two generators of the Grigorchuk overgroup, subgroup. Now this overgroup, it's not a torsion group unlike Grigorchuk group, because it has elements of infinite order. One ex simple example, when you multiply all generators, A times B hat times C hat times D hat, that's an element of infinite order. But it's still of intermediate growth. The number of elements of length n grows sub-exponentially. Although the growth is much faster than for the Grigorchuk group, it's much closer to the exponential growth, but still it's sub-exponential. -sub okay, so how to relate these two groups? Now we have two transformation groups, how to relate them? Well, since we have two transformation groups, the first thing is to relate the sets on which they act. The sets are quite different. For the Grigorchuk group and overgroup, we have strings of zeros and ones, all. For the topological um, full group, we have subshift sum by infinite strings over the different alphabet, A, B, C, D. So how to relate them? And, uh, there is a nice construction called the Schreier graph. This will do the job. So, uh, so we do Schreier graph, Schreier graph or action graph. It's a graph that encodes the action of the group. So we apply it to Grigorchuk group and overgroup. So th th this is the pattern, how to draw such a graph. 
vertices correspond to points of the set on which the group acts, and edges, edges are labeled by generators. So you have a point X and generator X map set to SX, you draw an arrow from X to SX. Then the inverse will map it back, so it go backward arrows. In our case, all generators are involutions, so instead of drawing, if we have an arrow from X to X, X, we have the same arrow backward. So instead of two directed uh, arrows, we just use, uh, draw one undirected edge. Okay, and, and so how this looks like for the Gregor true group. So that's how it looks like for generic element of the, for the Gregor true group. So as I said, <clears throat> here what we have, uh, we choose not the entire Schrei graph, we choose a connected component. Connected component corresponds to a, an orbit. And in that connected component, we identify a point by marking that point. So now we have a graph with a distinguished vertex and it's connected. And so you see from the definition, A will change this letter. So this particular Schreier graph is for the string of all zeros. This black dot, A will change just the first letter. So it, when you go to the right, that will be the string one and then all zeros. And then as I explained, two of the other three generators will also change one letter, the letter, the digit following the first zero. In this particular case, that will be the second digit. So to the left of that dot, we have the string zero, one, and then all zeros again. B and C will do this, and D will do nothing, so we have a loop. And, and this is how generic uh, orbit looks like. So uh, geometry of the graph, topology of the graph is the same. All graphs are the same. The only difference is the, this lab, these labels. Okay, so, um, so that, this is, no, not every uh, graph looks like that. We have exceptions. An exceptional, fortunately, is just one exceptional orbit. Orbit of the string 11111. Because, you know, B, C, and V, they look for the first zero in the sequence. And in that sequence, there is no first zero. So neither of them do anything. And so instead of linear structure of that graph, it has half linear structure. Original one. It's like a dead end. But fortunately, this is just one orbit and we remove it, everything is fine. Okay, so what happens? Let me return to this generic. So this is for the Grigorchuk group. What happens for the Grigorchuk overgroup? So some changes need to be made to this graph. Instead of double edge, instead of each double edge here, like this one, there will be just one edge because only one generator will do the job. And instead of one loop at each vertex, there will be two loops. The point is, it, when you forget about the loops, then this, this will be simply a linear graph. Simply linear graph with labeled edges. And so when you read labels of these edges, you get a by infinite sequence get by infinite sequence of letters A, B, C, and D, and turns out that's exactly the sequence that you have for the topological full group. So that this is the relation through the Schreier graphs because of their linear structure, we get the relation and that's simpler relation for the, the overgroup because we get exactly linear graph up to some loops at each point to loops. So correspondence between graphs and through that and points and loops. And so now how the action of these generators looks in, term of, in terms of topological free group. In, in terms of the graph, the action looks like the orbit remains the same, so the graph is the same. We only move that marked point. Namely, we move it along the, if we apply a certain generator, we move that point along the edge. So for this example, when we apply A, this point moves to the right. And in terms of the sequence of labels, the sequence is shift to the left. This is if the edge is to the right. And so if the edge is to the left, you move to the left. So this means in terms of uh, sequences, the action is exactly the same 
as for this generalized transposition delta for the cylinder dot A. And similar for any other generator, you have the action for the cylinders corresponding to one letter patterns. Delta A, delta B, delta C, delta D. The group generated by these transformations are isomorphic to the group to overgroup. And then using a relation between the overgroup and the group, you can get representation for um, the Gregor group as well. It's not patient, and it's a good time to stop. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. Uh, are there any questions? Let's send speaker again. Uh,